It is my pleasure to introduce today's program. So we have two uh, gentlemen speaking today, Derek Siever and Gary Dillabo. Uh, both, I would say, new friends of mine during the last year. Uh, and I'm, I'm really honored to count them among my friends. Uh, Derek is this new CEO of the SVO, formerly the San Jose Chamber of Commerce. Gary uh, runs a, a very large development group that's building a number of really critical projects for our city. I feel like we are at a place in time now that's unique in the 250 year history of our city. Uh, and uh, both of these guys are gonna help us understand a little better what we might be expecting in the next five or 10 years. So with that, Derek Siever. Thank you uh, so much, Steve. I, uh, I honestly, as a, as a new Red Badge member uh, of the Rotary, it is a little bit surreal to be up here at my first uh, meeting as a member. Uh, but Steve, thank you so much for the invitation uh, and excited to see uh, so many folks today, uh, frankly, in person, but also just to, to see all of you. It's great to be, great to be back out. Um, you know, I wanna tell you all a little uh, story uh, of a city. Um, in the fall of 1999, the population of this city stood at just a bit over 700,000 folks. The city proudly boasted a major league soccer team, and it was on the eve of getting its first National Hockey League entrant. It was an expansion team that was set to debut in 2000. The city had long been home to minor league baseball, uh, and also due to a large public university which was located just on the outskirts of the downtown, they boasted about a quasi-professional sports team that played on fall Saturday afternoons. The downtown of this city was an ill-defined area. It was made up of a collection of neighborhoods that were connected and adjoined, but felt worlds apart in economic development, culture, and income. It was bracketed on the east by large homes and the commercial businesses that employed the owners of those homes. And it was bracketed on the west by struggling retail, increasing homelessness, and hotels where rooms could be obtained for about $9 a night. The previous decade to 1999, the city's growth had slowed to its lowest level in its history, adding just about 25,000 people to its population. And it was in the fall of 1999 that the citizens of that city decided to go in a different direction. For the first time in 30 years, they elected a mayor of an opposite political party from the previous three decades, one who promised downtown revitalization through partnerships with all the different leaders in the downtown and seemed quite capable of delivering it. The city I am speaking of is Columbus, Ohio. And in the fall of 1999, I had the good pleasure of volunteering on one of my first political campaigns for Mike Coleman, who was then a first term council member running for mayor. And now, two decades later, we can see the results of his work. When he left office in 2015, he was lauded as one of the best mayors in the city's history. A local political consultant at his farewell was quoted as saying, if he wanted to be mayor forever, he could be. He was that good. Over community objection, he oversaw the destruction of the Columbus City Center Mall, a fixture of the downtown landscape, and in its place came the Columbus Commons Park. This move was controversial at the time. Now it is universally loved as a symbol of Columbus's revitalization. He partnered with local leaders and the Columbus Chamber of Commerce to fully revitalize the Franklinton and Old Town neighborhoods the latter of which was where those sub $10 hotel rooms were the norm just a few years earlier. And most importantly, as was also mentioned in his farewell, his biggest impact was pointing out the advantages of Columbus from a business standpoint. The results speak for themselves. Today, Columbus is one of the fastest growing cities in America. Its population has exceeded 900,000 residents and it's now the 14th largest city in the United States. In 1950, San Jose had a population of roughly 100,000 residents. In 2015, proudly, the city passed the 1 million population mark. In 2013, I proudly became one of the 90% of San Jose residents who could not trace their history here back to the end of World War II, which was a statistic that to me spoke to the dynamic and diverse growth of this city over the past half century and represented the belief that California was a place of endless opportunity and boundless possibilities for people around the world. Starting in 2018, however, things began to change. According to recent census data, San Jose has lost population in 2018, 2019, and again in 2020, the latter representing 1.26% of the city's population and the largest drop in population here in decades. 
The na nation's 10th largest city, San Jose, also runs the risk of losing that mantra to Austin, Texas in the next couple of years if the current trend continues. There's not much we can do about the data coming back from the 2020 census, but there will be another in less than a decade. And we're now on the clock, back to back, in the struggle to turn things around. California, our residents and our businesses are moving to Nevada, they're moving to Arizona, they're moving to Florida, they're moving to Texas. And all this news is good reason for concerned optimism. Concerned because some choices and subsequent outcomes are certainly headed in the wrong direction, but optimism because our region and our state have always been able to look where we are going, not to where we have been, and meet the challenge. For starters, we can't put our head in the sand about the issues we face. California, the Bay Area, and San Jose, despite world-class climate, enviable natural resources, and second to none diversity are facing significant impediments to economic competitiveness. Our housing costs are astronomical, our infrastructure is cracking, our regulatory code is too burdensome, and crime is unfortunately steadily increasing. I spent the first six years of my professional career in Columbus, the state capital of my home state. But in 2007, I moved to California because I was always told that this is a place where things happen. And while I dated California, I married San Jose. I fell in love with this place and its people, and it is my home. And I was genuine when I told a lot of folks that asked how humbled and honored I was to be selected for this position in such a short time after moving to our area. I watched Columbus's transformation under Mayor Coleman's leadership, but I was always unaware that in a place like Ohio, that type of leadership was the exception. In a place like California, it's the rule. And I'm wondering today if we can tell that same story to a young person in Ohio. So while we are aware of the problems, we must also meaningfully partner together to bring about the solutions. And as a chamber of commerce, we have to renew our own focus to this work. We have to be more accessible to small and medium sized businesses in our city. And we have to provide a direct value proposition to those business leaders so that when they face struggles with permitting and compliance, we're there to help them. We have to convene our largest members to provide resources, both financial and mentorship, to those businesses still struggling in the shadow of COVID. And those young entrepreneurs who want to invest in our city to make sure that they hit on all cylinders and share in the recovery. We have to make our events more community focused and want to partner on that so that they are not about us, but about the community that we serve. We have to partner to integrate our higher education institutions, San Jose State, and our world-class community college system more fully into the downtown. We have to end the labor business divide in San Jose, which effectively ensures that two caucuses exist on city council. And we have to recognize that in today's environment, rebuilding San Jose is the work of everybody together. In short, we at the SVO have to be the chamber of commerce for San Jose. And I would say that that is work that we're not just committed to in deed, but also in name. All of us should have as our goal that at the end of this work, we can say that our biggest impact was pointing out the benefits of San Jose from a business standpoint, not just to ourselves, but to kids in Ohio and in Massachusetts and in Texas and in nations around the world who today, right now, are dreaming about calling California and San Jose home and hopefully will in the years ahead. The upside of being down is that we can be bold and take the ideas of, that, that come with new risks and new thinking in the truest spirit of our city and region. We must not miss this opportunity when the chips appear to be down to make our city's potential our future reality. And finally, we have to recognize that the Chamber of Commerce and the Rotary and our elected leaders have the job of promotion and assistance, but we don't have the job of building or creating jobs. Our dynamic and innovative private sector, our risk takers serve that role, and we need to stand fully behind them and support them. One such leader and partner in that work is Gary Delabau of Urban Communities and his collaborative team. And it is my great pleasure to introduce him. And Gary, it is also my pleasure to share the stage with you today, and I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. Thank you. Be a little tough to follow. Um, I, I've uh, been very fortunate the last few months to get to have known Derek, and uh, I, I can tell you that uh, he's going to do some amazing things. Um, he listens, he engages, and uh, I think he has a vision that we can all get behind. And you know, I think some of the messages we're going to talk about today, you know, kind of are in parallel. 
And what, what uh, Steve had asked me to do was to really talk about what the journey that Jeff, my uh, partner, Jeff Ariaga and I, this journey we've been on the last few years. And that's to invest some time and effort in San Jose to see if we can help the city kind of level up. And they, uh, there's four areas that we want to touch on today. Uh, one is going to be, you know, why San Jose? Why now? And then thinking about things around what our goals are, short term and long term, and then ultimately how do we execute upon some of these ideas? Because that's where the most important part of this is going to be. So when we think about why San Jose, as you can imagine, I spent a fair amount of time talking to capital partners. And what capital partners will tell you right now is that San Jose is jumping up on the radar, more people are asking about it, and they ask us why. And we say, well, listen, there is a list of assets the city has that are as long as your arm. And they include things like the weather. And having this, this kind of weather is, is something that's fundamentally uh, competent groups of people in the world. You have an airport, it's one of the fastest growing airports in the United States. Then you have institutions like a, uh, education. <coughs> San Jose State is arguably one of the biggest engines of driving this valley forward. It sits right here in the middle of downtown. It's flanked by San, uh, Santa Clara, then having Stanford and Berkeley. It doesn't get much better than that. Then you start to look at venues where you have entertainment, where sports teams are taken care of. Uh, the list to me goes on and on and on. Then you have you know, a political will here that wants to drive verticality, it wants to drive density. So when I talk to these capital partners to say, who has more assets that are lining up in the United States that you're looking at today? They don't have an answer. And the thing that you add on top of all this is this city is flanked by some of the greatest companies in the world. These companies are looking to grow and expand and a lot of people are concerned about COVID and are things gonna slow down. You know, I would argue that that's not the case, that they're just starting and uh, there's gonna be a lot of chapters in front of this growth story. So that's why we believe in San Jose and we think it could be one of the greatest cities, not only in the United States, but truly in the world. So that's why San Jose, why now? This is a relatively simple answer. You know, when you look at places like San Francisco, it's a mess. Now it's ultimately gonna come back, but there's not a lot of capacity for growth in San Francisco. There's a limited amount of growth also in Oakland. And then as you work your way down into the Bay, places like Palo Alto and Mountain View, there's really no room to grow. And a lot of those cities don't want to embrace growth. They, they're, you're still kind of nimbyism going on there. Um, so when you look at it, and if you believe that this valley is gonna to continue to grow, and if you look at some of the stats, you know, in the last six months, there have been 50 IPOs here in this valley. Places like Columbus, places like Kansas City, if they had one or two, they'd be jumping up and down. Um, and we had 50. So the hope, I think the challenge for a lot of these companies is where they can find a place to truly plant their roots and grow these companies. And they're starting to look around places like Texas and back east, but I think ultimately because of the initial assets that we talked about, this is the place for them to land. Um, so that, that's kind of the why San Jose and why now. The next is really starting to drill into what we do. And we have a, some short-term goals and some long-term goals. Our long-term goal is very narrow. Uh, we want to help these companies I'm talking about accelerate their growth. These companies should focus on building great technology. And they shouldn't have to worry about office space. They shouldn't worry, have to worry about housing or transportation systems. That's what we should be able to take care of. So that's what we're focused on. And uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to do that with some, some unique levers. To help these companies grow, there's really three things that help drive them. One is how do you help them recruit? How do you help them retain those employees? And ultimately, can you inspire those employees? Can you make those employees more productive? So we think that is something that can be done. Uh, to the levers to make sure those things happen, you know, there's four or five of them. The first is design. We think that the buildings and the office projects that we, or the residential projects we create, need to be extraordinary. They need to be beautiful. So a, um, this is a, a little bit of an overview of the buildings that we're going to be building, <coughs> but this will give you oops, an idea of the people that will be designing them. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a partner by the name of West Bank. Uh, West Bank, uh, before we were engaging with them, they were focused on four cities in the world. Toronto, Vancouver, um, uh, Tokyo, and Seattle. And they, they saw some real hope here. When they get involved in the city, they go very deep. So we closed our deal with them in February of 2020. With a handful of months, we'd hired essentially eight architects. Uh, and included Kengo Kuma from Tokyo, uh, Bjarke Ingels out of Denmark, Bjarke, believe it or not, is designing $1 trillion worth of the projects around the world. And he's bringing that expertise right into our backyard. Then you have people like Jeannie Gang from Studio Gang out of Chicago, 
We have WRNS out of San Francisco, and then we have some local firms, RMW and Steinberg Hart, who help to make sure that as these uh, other architects come to the city, we move through the city officially, uh, effectively and efficiently. So this is the group of people that are, that are helping drive this design component. And what you'll see in a lot of our buildings is that sustainability and resiliency is something very important. We want to have a connection to nature. We want to make sure these buildings operate responsibly. So our entire portfolio of buildings will be net zero. And you'll see time and time again how there's a connection to nature, whether you're on the second floor or the 15th floor. It's something that's very important to people. Studies say that the closer you are to nature, the more productive you can be and the healthier that you'll be. But as important as you know, these big buildings are, there's also these assets that, that, that we think are treasures. And, and most of you have a you know, history with the uh, Bank of Italy. Uh, we're finally getting started on that project. It started a few weeks ago. And if you ever want to take a tour uh, in process or once it's done, please let me know. We'll get you through the building. We want to make sure that people have a little kinship to this project. Uh, but this is a going full force right now. And, and hopefully it's something that really illustrates what San Jose is about. Amazing framework. Beautiful building. It's just been a little bit a under taken care of, and now we want to kind of take it to the next level. Uh, here's a few other projects uh, that we're working on. Uh, if anybody wants to go into more detail, uh, we can walk you through them. Uh, this is going to be one of the largest uh, cross-laminated timber buildings in the United States. This is over by the Davidson site. And this is a, a project we just closed on the other day, and this is going to be a, a large uh, a residential uh, project. Now, Jeff and I, just so you know, we, we care so much about this city, we actually closed another property today. And, and our hope is that as you see this uh, group of buildings, that how do we tie them together? You know, how do we make sure there's some connectivity? And that's something that we're really driving towards. Now, as much as we're looking about these big buildings and how do we open that door, the next question is how do you start this process? And there's some housekeeping that we need to take care of in San Jose right now. We need to make the city a little safer, a little cleaner, and a little more vibrant. These are all things that can be done. Guys like Scott and the Downtown Association, what Derek's group is doing, what the Rotary does. There's a lot of efforts that are going into this. We're spending a lot of time with the police department, people like Groundworks. But I, th I think we need to drive it just a little bit harder to make sure when these companies come down, they can see the promise and the hope that we see in the city. Because right now, it's a little opaque, and we've got to do a little better job there. So short term, safety, cleanliness, and vibrancy, long term, you know, how do we really help these companies accelerate their growth? And I think that's it for pictures. Oh, this is the, the last one here on the, uh, the Valley Titles, uh, the uh, uh, Fountain Alley parking lot. Um, so the last component of this discussion is really about how do you execute? So it's easy to talk about these ideas. And I, I think there's a fair amount of skepticism if we can pull this off, and I think that's fair. But I, I also believe that there's only so much that, that one group can do, whether it's Rotary, whether it's guys like Jeff and I, but I think together, if we come under a, some kind of banner that has some real commonality and some very, um, I'd say aspirational and bold ideas, that's when we perform our best. And let's stop being incremental in the way that we look at things. Um, so my hope is that we can engage groups like you to really jump in the boat with us, make sure that we have a plan that we're all inspired by, and start to execute on some of these buildings, some of the ground plane, and bringing this retail to life. And ultimately, if we wrap all that together, the result will be creating a great community and improving the quality of lives of people who live here and work here. And uh, you know, we can talk about real estate all day long, but that's what our primary goal is, to really focus on community and then to focus on you know, improving the people's uh, quality of life. And that's really about it. John Goering, someone on, a, on the Zoom said that they're getting echoes as a, as a work in progress on that. So Gary and Jeff, uh, or Gary in his remarks, uh, made it sound like sort of business as usual. These are some guys doing some projects. This is something that has never happened in San Jose before. Uh, some of us are old timers who grew up here and have lived here our whole lives. There has never, never been a development phase like we are in now. If you combine what Jeff and Gary are doing with Jay Paul's work with the Adobe building and with this massive Google project, and that's not even to mention a number of other developers who are also doing significant projects, we've never had anything like this. So uh, just 
don't, don't think that Gary is just kind of a, a guy shuffling through town. It ain't the case. Uh, and I'm personally, as a person who lived here my whole life and raised my family here, I'm really grateful for what these guys are doing. They're walking, they're walking the walk. They're not just talking the talk. Uh, these are massive investments that are, they have the potential to change our community. Also, something I want to, again, compliment Jeff and Gary. From the moment they arrived, they've been supporting community events in a way that other developers historically generally haven't done. And I don't mean to pick on developers because uh, uh, a few of them are even my friends. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they would say I'm their friend. But th these are uh, you know, hardworking people investing lots of money. But these guys are doing an incredible amount of, uh, for our community. Um, so let's do some questions. Would you guys uh, like to go up to the mic? Let's start with uh, Norm Holberg. Remember, you read Badgers. You're encouraged to cut in line. Just push those people out of the way when you, when you get there. I got it first, you read Badgers. A um, lot of land sales, kudos. We're looking forward to a lot of things happening, but nothing is happening. The only crane, Jay Paul, nothing else. Is there anything other than construction costs that are holding back this burst of activity that we're hoping for? Well, well, listen, the, uh, the, the stark reality of the situation that we sit in right now is, is rents, office rents in downtown are about $3.50 a square foot. <laughs> to build the kind of buildings we're talking about here, you need to get the $6 rents. So when you're talking to capital partners, like, man, that, that's a huge, it's not going from three fifty dollars to four twenty five. dollars there's a big leap. Uh, and so we spend a lot of our time trying to demonstrate to capital that, listen, look what happened in Redwood City. Look what happened in Sunnyvale. Look what happened in Santa Clara. All those markets have taken off and, and they're above those numbers. So we believe they can be achieved. We also need to show them that there's, there's enough drive, there's enough demand for that. And so uh, yeah, we, we talk with them a lot about how you see the growth of the Googles, of the Apples of the world and where that might kind of end up. And if you look at the numbers, it really does show that in our, our belief, you can add another 15 or 20 million square feet to this area at those kind of rental rates. Um, but if you're not familiar with this area, it's a bit of a leap of faith. So everyone's kind of, you know, getting ready to go we're moving forward. We're not trying to time a market. We, we believe the demand's there. And I, I think guys like Jay Paul, Jay Paul is not a land holder. He, he's a guy who builds and, and has an, an, got an intuition that we really respect. So I think you'll start to see these projects moving forward. Um, you know, Jay Paul is already, you know, four stories deep and he's starting to put the superstructure on his building. We're a few months behind him, but we're working forward on that, that park habitat project. So um, I think you'll start to see those cranes starting to come to life. Thank you. Uh, so you were talking about the divide between labor and uh, capital in the, in the state or in the city. Uh, in Germany, the Chamber of Commerce, I met with them when I was over there on, on a, a trip and there, the Chamber of Commerce, you're required as a business to join the Chamber of Commerce. It's, there's no choice. Uh, but they talked about how labor and management work together to come up with real solutions. And so they have a lot less labor unrest. And the Germany's uh, output since the turn of the, since World War II has been phenomenal, their sustained output. Can you address how we can start breaking down that divide? No, absolutely. Thanks for the question. And I appreciate the perspective too from Germany. I think one of the great things about Chambers of Commerce is at all different parts of the world and all different parts of the country. They're all set up differently. The membership models are different. And certainly, you know, in Germany with a kind of a mandatory membership model, right, they're, they're dealing with some, some benefits uh, that we, we certainly don't have. Here, I think really where it does start, because it is a voluntary membership you know, organization for us, is it starts with how we have our leadership room structured to allow those different voices at the table. We have to recognize that, that specifically with the, with the private sector uh, unions and, and also I think even in general some of the public sector unions, it's a rising and falling boat and they're gonna rise and fall together. We don't have those conversations if those voices aren't in the room. And we've had historical models here in San Jose with past boards, past leadership of the organization where that has not been the case, where you've had labor and business together at the board level inside the organization and outside. I would also say that because our organization's history has had such a deep interface with city council and, and, and the city leadership here, it, it means a great deal on how we interact with those folks. If we're interacting with folks on the idea that they're in 
a labor caucus and a business caucus, that's gonna trickle down to how those relationships are, I think, with our, with our partner organizations. I don't think we can interact with our city's leaders like that anymore. I think we need to recognize that on any given Tuesday at City Council, depending on the issue, you're gonna have different coalitions of people supporting and opposing and, and doing different things. I've had a lot of conversations with all 10 members of the council, uh, and really so many of them that we would consider, you know, the other caucus are bringing up these key small and medium-sized business issues that we have not been as engaged in in the past. I think as we build those relationships, get those more meaningful and strategic in this voluntary system that we have here, I think we can build that you know, piece by piece going forward. So I think it's, it's about how we fill our rooms and how we posture ourselves with the, with the city. Hi, uh, Jeff Morgan with First Community Housing. First of all, I just wanted to say, uh, Gary, you blew through some mind blowing projects up there and some of the names you mentioned in design are absolutely out of sight. And somebody who's also trying to take risks and be visionary and do the right thing, I just wanted to salute you for that. So I've had a chance to talk to you about it, and, and I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, the other thing, Daryl, I'm going to throw a hardball at you a little bit. So we at First Community Housing withdrew from SBO because of the negative press that was received over what was perceived as a racist image that came across. And now... Black Lives Matter and with the culture change that we're seeing, I'm trying to adapt and learn at myself. So what I want to know as somebody who's left SVO, what kinds of things are you perceiving strategically uh, involving racial equity in the future with the chamber? Absolutely. No, thank you so much for that question. First, let me um, first let me say I, I want to on behalf of the organization, right? I want to make this clear. I want to apologize for what happened last fall. And I want to say that sincerely and meaningfully. It was unacceptable. It should never happen again. It will never happen again. And I, I want to say that I want to say that up front. So I think that that's key. But I come to this this role really with the, the knowledge that apologies are action. And it's what we do going forward that, that's going to make the difference. And, and let me just kind of briefly mention uh, mention three things. First of all, as, as probably most of you, you know, we no longer have a political action committee inside the chamber. It will, there are no plans to bring that back at present. And I will also tell you, and I shared this uh, during my, my selection process, that if at some future date that ever comes back, uh, it should be done under two principles. One, no candidates, ballot measure only. We believe business may have a place at the table in ballot measures. So that's principle one. Principle two, it needs to be done with the, with the decency and the principles that are befitting a diverse city as, like ours. And that was not always done in the past. And so if that happens, so, so that's, that's step one. Uh, two, and I mentioned a little bit in my remarks, again, our organization is driven by the room where it happens and who's in it. And so we, our board at the June meeting uh, has lowered our dues levels, gone to a subscription dues membership to allow for a far increase in our hope of small and medium sized business members. And we want those folks to be from all parts of our city of all business shapes and sizes so that when they are on our board and our decision making bodies, we have that diverse set of voices uh, at the table. The third is we are taking a lens to DEI that isn't just the DEI training for our board and staff, which we, which we are doing, but also a lens that says it needs to touch absolutely everything that we do. We're a 135 year organization, we touch a lot of things, and so we need to make sure that that's embedded in what we do. And I'll give you a prime example, it's also a conversation I have with, with the members of council. In the past, most of our events, if not all, were in certain locations, a lot very downtown in certain locations. We need to get our events out in the community. We need to make sure that our events are not just for chamber members and the attendees, that they're serving the different areas uh, of our city as, as we do that. So as COVID ends and we come back online, we're gonna put that, that lens on it. Uh, ultimately, this is work that we understand is gonna only be done after a long time of doing good work and making good decisions again, we get that. But in the interim, we, we're taking steps to address that and, and very much appreciate the question because yeah. it it's a key question. Thank you very much. Hi there, Mr. Irma Garcia. If you can ask the question quickly, we're actually out of time, but That'd out of courtesy to you, I'm gonna let you ask your question. I would ask whoever answered it to answer it Let me flash my red badge really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> With that, uh, kudos on the uh, DEI stance. I know it's a different terrain, and it's certainly one of the many um, impediments that we maybe didn't touch on quite as much, but I'm wondering what you'd say is the largest impediment for San Jose's city vibrance. So I will uh, thank you so much for the question. And I'll answer that actually um, as quickly as I can. We actually just polled our members two weeks ago to ask them that question. And I will tell you, there's, there's a number of areas, but I would tell you what came to the top of that list were workforce housing. 
right? The ability to f find affordable and accessible housing, uh, workforce retention and development, which I think Gary mentioned in his comments. Yes, moving along. And, <laughs> and we will release those results to the Rotary. So you can, you can see it all. Thank so we you. actually are asking our members exactly that question. Excellent, thank you so much. Gary's got 15 seconds and then I'm gonna wrap up in less than a minute. Yeah, listen, I, I think some things that we need to address here is respect, right? And to us, having uh, workers, you know, three hours away from the city, getting in, in suburbans, three o'clock in the morning and having to drive all the way here and drive home, that's not respectful. And we've got to find a way to make sure the people who build the city can live in the city, the people who protect the city live in the city. That's one of the things that we're really gonna focus upon is how do we make sure that we create housing for this next generation of people who are gonna bring the city out of the ground. And if we do that, I think we can be extraordinarily innovative and thoughtful, but we've got, th these, are, these are heavy lifts. That's we need to come together to do this, but if we do it correctly, it'll be a great model for the rest of the country, and something I think we'll all be very proud of. So that's what we're gonna be asking of you guys in the future to help us solve some of these problems. So there's a question or two about parking. And so you'll take your parking ticket to the validation machine on the other side of the wall here, or downstairs where there's a validation machine, you'll see Teresa there. And so either Teresa or I will validate your ticket. There is a 90 minute grace period. So if you've been here less than an hour and a half, you can just go and get out without paying. Otherwise we'll pick up the tab for your parking. And can I ask you to please bust your tables? We don't have any Fairmont or support staff. There's garbage and recycling in the back. Thank you. Well, don't leave yet. First, I wanna thank Gary and Derek for uh, being our guest today appreciate it very much and a donation in your name will be made to city lights theater company that was your little surprise lisa Millette. and next week we have teresa and blanca alvarado mother and daughter uh, teresa's a member of our club uh, and these are important uh, people in the history of our city both uh, past and future and with that thanks for sitting through my first meeting